You know what's more fun than solving a maze by yourself? Is letting your computer do it for you. All the fun from solving a maze comes from letting someone else do it for you. Like, why would you want to do all that manual labor yourself? Hey, today's your lucky day. We're going to be teaching your computer how to do that. Hello, everybody. I'm Ferrara, and today we're going to be talking about depth for a search, which is basically the way you solve a maze. You go as far down the maze as you can. Once you get to a dead end, you go back until you can take another path and go from there. Let's say in this very theoretical world that you're trying to solve a maze. I know that people just don't solve mazes anymore, they're kind of a relic of the past, you know what I'm saying? But, we're gonna do it anyway. So basically we gotta get from this point here, to this point here. Alright, so basically what our approach is, is we just go, right? We just go through the maze, we go like that, we go like that, we go like that. Oh shoot, we got stuck! And then we go back, and then we're like, oh we can take this path, no! And then we go around, and then we try the other path, and we keep going until we get stuck. God dang it! I forgot how annoying mazes are. Okay, now we go back to here, we go this way, then we go down, then we go down, then we go that way. Dang it, this is a hard maze. You know what? Well, this is why we teach a computer how to do it, because I'm not doing this anymore. This, this is too hard for me. But to show you the difference between this and breadth research, what you basically do in breadth research is you go like one step at a time, you go this way and you go this way. And then you're like, oh, let's go one more this way, and one more this way, and then one more this way, and then one more this way. And then you just keep going like that. But that's not really fit, and that sucks. I don't want to be doing this for 20 hours. One hour is enough time to spend solving this maze. Bruh. Like, who the heck solves a maze like that? That's why we gotta use DFS. So let's, let's, let's like, transfer this from nonsensical mazes to actual CS. Alrighty, we have a nice little CS graph here, and now we're gonna do DFS on it. Not BFS, we're gonna do DFS this time. So we're gonna start with zero, and we put it in our line just like we did in BFS. So, whoops, I know what the difference between zero and one is. So zero is first in our line, right? So we look at our first guy in our line, this is zero, and we're like, hey, what are its neighbors? So we go to one, and we're like, hey, let's add one to the list. And then we say, hey, we have four as well as a neighbor of zero. So we add four to our line. Very cool. And with zero, we take out zero from our list and line and everything. And now, the cool stuff happens. In BFS, we would be a nice guy and take the guy who was waiting in line for longer. So we would take one, because he's first in line. But no, we're gonna reverse psychology them so hard that we're gonna take the four. So basically in depth research, instead of taking from the front of the line, we take from the end of the line. So we go to four instead, we just cheated that one. See, this is why you don't cut, okay? They might just take from the end of the line. So we go to 4, we say 8, his neighbor is 5, so we add 5 to the line, and then we get rid of 4, because we're done with that. And then we take from the end of the line again, we get 5, and then we add 6, get rid of 5, and then there's nothing to add for 6, so we get rid of 6. And now, now that we finished the end of the line, we can go back to our 1, and then we could say, hey, let's go to 2, and 3 are his neighbors, so we do 2 and 3, get rid of 1. And then we go to 2, get rid of that, and then we go to 3, get rid of that, and then go to 2, get rid of that. So basically, the order in which we cross things off from the list is our DFS order. So, our order would be 0, 4, 5, 6, 1, 3, 2. So let me clear up this graph again, and let's see exactly what this means. So we said that our depth first traversal was 0, 4, 5, 6, 1, 3, 2. So basically, what we do is we go here, then we go to the bigger one of its children, then we go to the biggest one of its child, and then we go to the biggest one of its child, and then we go back to the 5, and then we say, is there anything else we could do? No. So then we go back, no, then we go back, and then we could go another path. So then we go to the 1, and then we're like, hey, we could go to 3 or 2, so we go to the bigger of the 2, go to 3, we're done with that, we go back to 1, and then we go to 2. So now it's quite clear why it's called backtracking. We basically go as far down our graph as possible, then we go back up, and then we go down again. Just like we saw that maze. So the line we were using, instead of the normal BFS line where we take the first guy, instead we took the last guy, that's called a stack. So basically instead of a queue, we're going to use a stack in DFS. So basically there are two ways to code this. The first is just using a stack instead of a queue. So basically the DFS code using a stack is exactly the same as the BFS code except we replace a Q with a stack. So, I basically have a stack over here, we have our whether or not each vertex is visited, we have our graph representation as an adjacency list, and then we start by first putting our zero into our stack, right? And then, while we still have stuff in our line, we take off the first guy, 
if we've already gone into our current node, if it's like crossed out, then we don't have to consider it just in case we like put it in a stack twice and then we cross it off. And then we take it off our queue. So now we basically have our first thing in a line, we like crossed it off and now we gotta look at its neighbors. So basically we look at all its neighbors and if they're not visited, that means we didn't cross them out, then we put them in our stack. So basically in our example, my circles around it were putting them in the stack. And then the crossing off of them was setting visited to true. Very nice. But there's another way to do this. It's basically using recursion. So here's the recursive code for DFS, okay? So we basically have our recursive method over here. It takes in a node, so that's the current node that we're at. And then if we're currently visited, so like in our stack, if the current node is visited, then we just like don't do anything on it. But if it's not visited, we set it to visited. And then we go through all its neighbors and then recurse on them. And then we start with zero, we just recurse on zero. Let me show you exactly how this works in the diagram. So we start with recurse zero, right? R zero. And then recurse zero is gonna call R4 and R1. So R0 is not visited yet, so we set it to visited, and then we call it on its neighbors. So we first call it an R4. And then before we could get back to R1, we still had to finish R4 before we could get back to R0. So then we call R4, and then we cross out 4, call it, we set it to visited, and then we call R5. And then we do the same thing for 5, and then the same thing for 6. So hooray, we finally finished calling R6 because there's no other calls to it, there's no neighbors that we have to call it on. So then 6 gets finished, and then 5 gets finished, and then 4 gets finished, and then we could continue where we left off with R0. So then we go to R1, we set it to visited, then we go to R3, and then only once we finish R3 can we call R2. So we set R3 to visited, and then we go to R2, and then we'll blammo. We literally did the exact same thing. And basically the R represents the recursive function that we just did, right? And you saw how only once a function is finished, can it go back to the original function. So basically it just ends up looking exactly like the graph, right? We just went down, 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 we went up all the way to zero, then we went to one, then we went to three, then we went back up to one, and then we went to two. So that's basically how DFS works. So now you know an algorithm, and you probably want to know how to apply it, right? Like, like, no, of course you don't want to know how to apply it. You totally don't need to know how to apply for years ago. Just kidding, you do. Basically, the main applications are generating permutations, finding cycles in a graph, and topological sort. The cycles and topological sort algorithms are like algorithms of their own, so I'll just focus on the permutations algorithm, and I'll just explain it real quick. Okay, let's say theoretically you want to permute the numbers 1, 2, and 3. So, you would start with an empty permutation. So, we want to eventually build it up to a permutation with three numbers in it, 1, 2, and 3. So we start with nothing in it. And then in our DFS, we first go to adding a 1 in it. And then from this 1, we could add a 2 or a 3. So we first go with the 2, so we do 1, 2. And then before we go back to our 1, we first add another thing to our 1, 2. And the only option we got is a 1, 3. 1, 2, 3. And now that we're done with this tree, we go back up to 1, 2. Are there any other options for 1, 2? Could we do put anything in the last spot? No. So we go back up 1. So we go to 1. So what else could we do with the 1? We could add a 3 after it. So we do 1, 3. And then the only thing that could go after the 3 is the 2. So we go to 1, 2, 1, 3, 2. All right. So now we have two finished permutations. So we go back up. Could we do anything else with 1, 3? No, we can't because 2 is the only option for the last digit. And then we go up again. Is there anything else we can do for one? No, because two and three were the only options. So we go back up to the empty set. Instead of one, we could have just put a two. And then we repeat the process for two. And let me show you how the tree looks. So that's basically how the tree looks. I didn't finish it for three, but you get the idea. You basically just go down as far as you can, get your permutation, then go back up, see if there's any other options. If there's none, you go back up. And then you go down again to explore other options. Very cool. So basically DFS is useful whenever you want to get something fast. If you did BFS on this, you would have to wait until all of your permutations are done to have a single permutation. But here, it finds a permutation, then goes to the next permutation, then goes back up, finds another permutation, and it's just, in general, useful. Ultimately, they like kind of achieve the same goals, but the order is actually really important. DFS is just not that useful for finding shortest path because you visit farther away vertexes, ver ver vertices, before you visit close ones. So it's just not useful for shortest paths, but it is useful for this kind of stuff, where you could find a permutation, do some stuff with that permutation, and then find a new permutation. Alrighty, that's all I got to say for DFS. DFS is a super useful algorithm. Make sure you know it. It's one of the most fundamental algorithms along with DFS, so if you know DFS, you're ready to move on to more complicated algorithms. Also, the like concept of recursion and being able to use that is also super useful. The concept of having a stack, concept of recursion, all super useful. So hopefully this was helpful. If you guys want me to do any other kind of things, let me know. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. 
and subscribe for more. Thank you guys for watching so much, and see you guys next time.